Hi everyone, today we're going to take a look at the DrivePro 220. Now this is a dash cam similar to the DrivePro 100 or the DrivePro 200 that I previously reviewed. Now there's a bit of a story about this one. I actually had Transend send me this around a year ago and there was some confusion about where it was, where it had been sent, where it had gone back to them, whether the courier still had it. So long story short, I've had this camera for over a year. Um, Transcend have been chasing me, uh, you know, asking for it back. Unfortunately, I didn't have access to it, so I wasn't able to give it back to them either. Um, and there was a few failed pickup attempts and things like that. So yeah, Transcend, when they finally watch this, might be thinking, okay, can we please just have our camera back? Um, but I am going to take the time to do a quick review before I send it back to them in the post later today. So what are the big differences between the DrivePro 220 and say the 100 or the 200? Well the big ones that excite me is it has GPS built in for logging your location, speed and time. Now some people might not like that because having your speed logged could work against you in the future. Um, for instance, if you have a crash and it turns out you were speeding. So, you know, some people might not like that. Um, you also have lane departure warning system. Now, the idea of this is that, let's say you're going along the motorway or the highway or the freeway, and you start to drift out of your lane. The camera should detect that and beep or alert you somehow. Now, literally, I've just taken it out of the box now. So, apart from watching other people's YouTube videos, I haven't tested this myself. So, I'm really looking forward to that. And you'll see that it also has a flexible speed limit alert. So, you could set it, let's say, for example, the speed limit in your area is 45 miles an hour or 80 kilometers an hour or something like that. You could set it here and then whenever you go over that speed, this will beep to remind you, hey, slow down a little bit. So inside the box, you get the instruction manual and a bunch of other paperwork that no one's really interested in. You could say 16 gig SD card. I do like that they give you an SD card because it means as soon as you take it out of the box, you're ready to use it. You get the mount, which sticks to your windscreen. Um, pretty much just peel off the back and stick it on. It's 3M tape, holds pretty much forever. But they do give you a spare one in case you decide you want to remove it and then put it on a different car or a different position. And of course they give you the power supply because it does need to be powered while it's in your car. Now this is a little bit bulky. Um, basically it's just a 12 volt to 5 volt converter with a micro USB cable on the end. So what I prefer to do is um, buy these little converters on eBay. I'll put a picture somewhere here, but basically you can install them behind your dash it would drop the 12 volts down to 5 volts and then just run a regular USB cable or even cut this off and use this one because you don't really want this plugged into your cigarette lighter all the time. I mean it's okay but if you want a really nice professional looking finish you should get it installed properly or do it properly yourself rather than having this cable sort of hanging around your car. And just like the previous models it does have Wi-Fi so you can transfer your files over using your smartphone or iPad. In reality I don't know how useful that is. I think a lot of people would just remove the SD card and plug it into a computer, but the option's there, so I'm sure some people would use that. So let's just plug in the micro SD card that comes supplied with the camera. If you're wondering about this red button here, it serves the same purpose on the old one. Let's say that something happens and you want to secure whatever footage has just been recorded, you press that and it will lock the file. That means that even if you continue driving for another 200 hours, it won't overwrite that file because you've already marked it as important. That's a very useful feature. Now this has been sitting in the box for around a year, so of course the battery is dead. Um, so I just grabbed my power pack and plugged this into that. Now like I said, it does just run on USB power. So I have my USB power bank here and I can plug this in directly. You see the camera's turning on. Let's just go through the initial setup. I won't bother putting in the proper date and everything. And there you go. You can see it's got a very wide angle, probably wider than the camera I'm recording on. And the camera I'm recording on is further back. So very wide angle, which is good because when you're driving along, you want to make sure you get everything recorded. And you see that because as soon as power is applied, it starts recording. The idea is that as soon as you turn on your car, this will turn on and it will start recording. So you don't have to worry about pressing any buttons. You don't have to worry about doing anything. It will just automatically start recording. So let's have a quick look at the menu. You can see Wi-Fi connection, resolution, let's make sure that's on 1080, yes it is, 30 frames per second. Exposure, I'll leave that as default. Video, leave that as default. Uh, video stamp, I think I will turn that, uh, I'll leave it on both, yeah, that's fine. Voice recording, yep, let's make sure that's turned on. G-sensor, now hopefully they've improved this because the G-sensor is meant to be that if you get in a crash, it's going to basically pick up the G-Force and automatically lock the file recording because it thinks something's happened. Now on some of the older um, 
Transcend Drive Pros, the G sensor pretty much every time you went over a bump, it would it would start going crazy thinking you've been in a crash. So hopefully they've improved that. You see, you can change it between low, medium, and high. So I'll leave it on low, and hopefully that will be okay. Forward collision. Now I believe this is when you're getting too close to someone uh, in the vehicle ahead. It will actually warn you. So I'm looking forward to trying that out. Let's see. Let's leave it on the default setting. Lane departure warning. Yep, we'll leave that on the default setting. Speed alarm. Now I notice this in kilometers per hour. Um, I don't know. Can you change that to miles? Oh, there you go. You can change it to miles per hour. So I'll set that to miles. Oops. So I'll set that to miles per hour. Check the speed alarm. I'll set that to 70. Lane departure. I'll set that to 70. Actually, I'll leave that on 60. GPS status. Well, it's got no fix right now because I'm indoors. I'm sure once I take it outside, it would be absolutely fine. Navigation system. GPS GLONASS. Now that's interesting. I think GLONASS is the Russian uh, satellite navigation system. So, of course, everyone knows that these um, these dash cams are super popular in Russia because it seems like crazy stuff's always going on there. So that's interesting that they built in support for both within the same camera. Very interesting. And most of these other settings don't really seem interesting. Now you so can see that I've removed the cable and it's still running because it does have a battery built inside which is very good because if your car suddenly loses power for instance if you have a heavy crash you don't want it to immediately turn off now it did turn off then because I've only had it plugged in for you know a few minutes to record this video but you do see that it did have some battery life and once I'm sure it probably takes like 30 minutes or 60 minutes to reach a full charge so it is a very useful thing that they put a battery in here so basically I'm going to take this out get some footage and show you how it works hopefully I can show you in the car as well the lane departure warning system I'm gonna to have to try and set my camera up in the back somehow. Uh, I'm really excited to test those features. So you can see it's recognized the lane markers and it's applied a green line to show where they are. Now if I start to veer over to this side here, it should start to beep and turn the line red. So let's see what happens. So you can see it's now turned them off. Whenever my speed drops below around 65 miles an hour, it turns off. Even though I put it in the settings, I think it's, I don't know if it's 60 or 70, it's kind of annoying, I would rather that it could still do the lane markings, even at say 50 miles an hour, or 60 at the least. I've pretty much got beeps going off everywhere. I've got beeps telling me I'm changing lane. I've got beeps telling me I'm going over the specific speed limit I've set. And I had a beep saying I'm too close to people. So you can see now this guy cut in front of me, or pulled in front of me. It's highlighted that we're too close and we need to give some distance to avoid the crash. So I'll now try to go on the rumble strip. And you see that we not only had the rumble strip, but we also had the Transcend Drive Pro 220 pick up the fact that we're drifting over the lane. So I'll now try to go on the rumble strip. You can see that we not only had the rumble strip, but we also had the Transcend Drive Pro 220 pick up the fact that we're drifting over the lane.
So after spending a few hours on the road with the Dry Pro 220, I have to admit that the extra features they've added to this really weren't that useful. They're pretty impressive and they're fun to show people, but they're not that practical. One thing I was impressed with is how well this detects the road markings, the lane markings, that it then uses to tell you if you're veering off your lane. Even when it was raining and dark, it still managed to find the lines and warn me if I veered over. But the thing is, you also get that warning every time you change lanes. Because it's not hooked up to the car, you know, electrical system, it doesn't know if you're indicating. So if you indicate, you're going to get beep, 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 warning you that you're changing lanes. So it kind of just got a bit annoying, um, and you pretty much ignore it after a while, because every time you change lanes, it's beeping. Every time you get too close to someone, it's beeping. When you go a little bit too fast, it's beeping. So it pretty much beeps so much that you just ignore it. And the next issue is that it only works when you get to around 65 coming on to 70 miles an hour. Um, I set this, I think, to 60 in the settings, but of course the GPS speed versus the uh, speedometer and so on don't match exactly. Um, probably the GPS speed is more accurate. But the problem is that on the motorway, although you'd love to be going at 70 miles an hour or 80 miles an hour all the time, reality is that you often drop below that, and then most of the features disable themselves. The lane detection won't work anymore. The um, the thing that tells you when you're too close to someone doesn't work anymore. They you know they require minimum speed, which I don't really understand why. Um, because I would rather turn that on at say anything over 45 miles an hour. Why not give that as a setting in here? Because it's just one more setting. Why does it matter if people find that that's too low? They could always increase the speed. Um, so why not just add it as an option for us to decide whether we want it or not? And as for the G sensor, I had to turn it off. Even when I had it on low, every time I hit the smallest little bump in the road, it was doing the emergency recording, just like some of the older models. So the the G sensor thing is pretty much useless um, unless you want it to lock every single recording that you do. And one thing with the warning about when you get too close to cars, sometimes I found that it didn't pretty much activate until I was right on top of the car in front of me, whereas other times I could be very far away and it would activate. So it seems a bit hit and miss whether that works. A lot of the time I was so close to the car in front that by the time the warning came I was pretty you know, pretty much too close anyway. Of course I only did that as a test and uh, I didn't, you know, didn't get too close that I felt it was unsafe, but yeah, that, that feature could probably do with some improvements. So overall I still think the camera's fantastic. The image quality is excellent, the screen is very good, it's a reliable camera, reliable brand, you get everything you need in the box, they give you a super long power cable to power it, it's, you know, it's a very good device. It's got the GPS built in, which can be good in the case of an accident because it will show your route exactly, your speed and so on although like I mentioned earlier it could work against you if you were going too fast um, but that's just the way GPS is it's gonna log everything so if you enjoyed this video please give a thumbs up and subscribe and if you have any questions put them in the comment section down below thanks for watching